Let's do this. The cult of hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here tonight with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? <laughs> Pretty good. Pretty good, Bruce. Never in doubt. Never in doubt. Never in doubt. Well, maybe a little Guessing bit. Guessing there's probably a few uh, PO reporters out there that have to hop on another eight-hour flight from Florida back to Alberta after probably think, some of them secretly hoping the series would be over in four. I think now more fearing it's going to go with the full seven. Yeah, I think there's more PO'd Panthers, Bruce, than... Well, yeah, the Edmonton reporters knew they were flying back here anyway, right? Yeah, you're from Edmonton. Like, <laughs> this the Panthers ones now have to make two more flights, one here and one back home again, whether there's a game seven or not. Oilers win 5-3 over the Panthers, forcing a game six. Bruce, I'm thrilled uh, for the Oilers team. They really have come back repeatedly this year. And, um, you know, as unlikely as it was, they're... They're two wins away from a Stanley Cup victory. Um, it was a very close game in the end, although somewhat impacted by score effects. The Oilers yeah. and the Florida Panthers both had 11 grade A shots, and they both had f- five five alarm shots. So exactly even when it came to dangerous chances. Oh. And in the end, the difference was, there was many differences, but one of them was Stuart Skinner out playing uh, Sergei Borovsky. <clears throat> well, there was one goal on a grade B shot, and it didn't go in on Skinner. So <laughs> exactly, that was the difference. We would be howling; the city would be howling oh. if that had gone in on Stuart Skinner. I'm glad. Anyway, we'll get to Stuart Stuart Skinner. Bruce, I'm just glad. Like, there's such a great feeling in Edmonton right now. Mm-hmm. It's such a kind of happy party atmosphere. It's bringing the city together. Um, I don't know if you've been downtown at all um, for any of the you know the game night festivities it's it is a magical feeling down there in a in a neighborhood that what that was had the hell beat out of it in the last few years due to various reasons which we won't get into and has been um you know slowly recovering man is that's fantastic what's going on down there it's fantastic with the orders and if you believe that um some people believe bruce that that reality follows the best possible narrative um this might be playing out before our eyes. This might, you know, the owners um, might be on their way to something that hasn't been done since 1942. And uh, two wins away. Yeah. Of course, no, still no margin for error. Still no Flor- margin for error. Florida's got two cracks at it. And Edmonton has one, which is to flip heads two more times. Yeah, well, it's gone from the odds. What were the odds? They, they, if it was four coin flips, was that one in 16? Yeah, it was one in 16, and that going into tonight, one in eight. So no, going into next four. game, one in four. And that's assuming that there's no, you know, that's an equally weighted yeah, coin in I'm terms not, of team strength and home ice advantage means nothing and so on. But Yeah, when we started those coin flips, we had both agreed, I think, that Florida had a slight edge in terms of the weight of the coin. Maybe mm-hmm. it was just 55-45. Maybe it wasn't that much, but I'm going to say the Oilers have like a 60-40 edge. They're in their heads at this flips. point. Six, maybe 66-33% edge or 70-30 edge at this point. The Oilers have had two games where they've come out and dominated. And Florida was able to s- scramble back. And I'm sure in Florida they're all losing their minds over that too many men call that wasn't <laughs> that wasn't called. Heading into the game, so much was made of the referees. Like, what was uh-huh. it? The Oilers had lost nine straight times with these refs. Yeah, well, one of the refs. Um, yeah, Florida was nine and one with one with the two either of the two refs. I and see. Edmonton, Florida was nine and one, and Edmonton was zero and nine. Oh. Nothing to see here. That, I think that was one of the refs. That would have been uh, what's his name, O'Rourke. Oh, so that oh. wasn't both of them working together. That was just one of them. Yeah, I think they they had records for each ref, and sometimes, of course, they will have ref together. But well, maybe Bruce, so. all of our outre- uh, all of our outrageous kvetching got inside of the uh, referees' heads, mm-hmm. <laughs> and they well, they missed and, a few. You know, they missed uh, Sam Bennett uh, knocking down uh, Stu Skinner, and 
Yeah. And they, in the crease. Yeah, Simpson and they missed, said that should uh, be a penalty. Yeah, yeah, and they missed him. Same player, Sam Bennett, kind of running Dylan Holloway, but they also missed out too many men. And also, I thought, crucially, they evened up the Dylan Holloway penalty in the third period with the uh, embellishment. I, on, I think uh, the refs are sick of Florida's sure. embellishing, Bruce. Yeah, I good. really think. I think they're on to it, and uh-huh. they're sick of it. They've had good. enough of it. Yeah, I think good, too. Yeah. I want to see what they do in soccer. I tweeted about this today. I was watching the Euro 2024 today and a guy took a dive out there and the ref went over and gave the diver a yellow card and awarded no foul at all it was just all he called was diving and they never do that in the nhl it's like embellishment only because you tried to draw a penalty which wasn't one so we're not going to going to say well there was a penalty but we're going to call another penalty on you for diving it should just be nope diving hit the box shorthanded for two minutes but they never You're- call it that way anymore European football is just crazy because in such a low event game and with a penalty in the box, having such massive significance, because it's not just a power play. Oh, yeah, it's, yeah, a, it's, a it's a free kick where you're expected to score a good score. I don't know what the rate is, but it, what do they score? 80%. Yeah. So it's just so massive, the incentive to cheat, right? It is absolutely, <laughs> utterly <laughs> massive. Anyway, this guy got correctly fingered for... Did he get a red really, card? Uh, just yellow. Just okay. yellow. And, uh, but that puts him on notice. Of course, then he can't cross the line uh, doing that or anything yellow. else for the rest of the game, right? And also it yeah. counts against him for the tournament. So it's, it's a significant penalty. <coughs> Pardon me, penalty. Well, it looks like my team England, Bruce, finally has the right combination, if you ask me. I don't know if you saw them in the first game, but that Bellingham kid can play soccer. All right, moving on. Bruce, what is, this is our two good things, two bad things, and two numbers podcast with one conundrum. Bruce, we'll go two good things each. What's your first? Yeah, I got to go with the game's first goal scored for the second straight game, shorthanded by the Oilers, with Florida getting the game's first power play and Edmonton not only killing it, but scoring. Uh, last game, it was Yanmark who scored from Brown uh, to open the scoring, and Oilers pulled out into the lead and Florida never caught up. Well, guess what? That happened again tonight. A lot closer score at the end, but Florida never did tie it up after falling behind one nothing. And that it was just such a fantastic play by Connor Brown uh, in all three zones, really. It was a solo effort, like it was a pure unassisted goal. And uh, he made a great play to... Uh, snake his stick out and, and uh, get a piece of Brandon Montour's uh, D-to-D pass, a point-to-point pass in the uh, 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 in the D zone. He chipped it out into the neutral zone. And he, kind of, he had a little bit of a head start there, but uh, uh, none other than Alexander Barkov, Sasha Barkov, the uh, league's top defensive forward and, and Selkie Trophy winner, and Brown was able to muscle him off the puck and then go in alone. And then in the offensive zone, of course, all he had left was uh, goalie Bob's. Uh, what a deep. Sergei what Bobrovsky, a and he deked him and <laughs> slotted it home. Like, it was just a, a trip. Three great portions of the play, one in each zone. Yeah. Brown clearly winning each of those battles and getting the unassisted goal that uh, kicked off the win. Just a fantastic play. Yeah. He came out this game shot out of a cannon, Bruce, because he set up. Uh, yeah, He's flying out there. Early chance. And like you know 15 what? seconds into the first period, eh? I don't know what Montour was thinking on that pass. It wasn't there. And oh. uh, yeah. But, and then his, um, I think if you watch, what I liked about that goal was, that was a goal scorer's goal. It was the first time I've seen Connor Brown actually score a goal scorer's goal because he faked the shot and he froze Bob for just a microsecond. That's all, That's all it took. And that was a great and beat him across shot. the net and just beat him across the net because of it. He he wouldn't you'd never beat Bob otherwise, but Bob had to hold up because it looked like Brown might shoot. And that was fantastic. remember game one. They tried to beat him with Deeks a couple times low, and they Bob could just yeah. go cover both posts with his legs when he's backing into his net. But I think you're right that it was the just the feint of the uh, release that maybe maybe uh, uh, messed up his timing a little bit. And then Brown was able to take it right across to the backhand and 
Bobrovsky even got a little piece of it, but not enough. And in she went, and what a great start to the game again. Second game in a row, we've seen an oiler in the penalty box celebrating, thinking, I don't want to be the goat here. Come on, boys. Kill. Hey, we scored. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was on Kulak. Um, Kulak tonight, it was Nurse yeah. last game. Both times, they, they zeroed in on that guy. <laughs> so, Bruce, uh, I made a request to Boiler fans, and both of my game grades out on Twitter, I said, I don't... I don't want to hear one more whine, gripe, or bitch about Connor Brown's bonus payment. Agreed? Or asking too much? Oh, uh, you will. I know uh, I will. You will next season when it I kicks know I in. Will. Oh, for sure. Right. Do you think uh, he's covered the- it? Because we talked about this last game, Bruce, and you weren't sh- I'm saying he's covered it now. He's covered his contract for this year. His, he's, he's, in the end... He's been worth a $4 million contract this season. That's my argument. They, over, they overpaid him in the regular season uh, because it was always going to be a recovery season with the kind of injury he had. It just took you know, 40 or 50 or 60 games for him to come around. But the whole point of signing him in the first place was to have a, you know, a good, reliable veteran in the playoffs. They didn't need him to make the playoffs, but they sure in the hell need him now. And he's delivering now, so I think that uh, a lot, you know, a lot of the air has gone out of that balloon. Not all of it. No, not right. all There'll of be it. People no. complaining about it, but I, I'm saying he's covered his bet. You know, you could say he, he, he Do won't. Do that again, have, Game Seven. He didn't cover his bet. Yeah, you're so greedy, <laughs> Bruce. He didn't cover his bet. You know, and you could say he had to play like a top six forward. Like you're getting paid like a mm-hmm. yep. top six forward in theory. Um, what are you looking at there? Up. Oh, okay. Uh, I thought there might be something wrong with uh, our recording like last nope. time, but no. yep. my window over my monitors. Okay. Um, I th- uh, yeah, I can't even remember what I said. All right, Sorry. I'm gonna go to my. Good We're talking thing. about Connor Brown, but you yeah. go to your good thing. We've covered we've covered that the the, uh, yep. the territory. All right, um, Bruce, my good thing is Connor McDavid, and I gave him a nine, tempted to give him a 10. Um, yeah. Yeah, tempted, but um, with a majestic game like that, he, I think he's going to win the MVP. We'll see what happens, but he, win or lose, like um, he's having a playoff season for the ages and a Stanley Cup final for the ages, two four-point games in a row to bring his team back. Give his team a chance. I think it's going to go along with with voters. Unless Bobrovsky steals, absolutely steals a win, um, then he could still win. Other than that, that's the only person who could beat him at this point. He was really quiet in the first period. The puck was bouncing all over Ooh. the place. And and he was Ooh. troubled by it. Nuge, dry settle, all the skill players. And it just was it ever going to settle it out, settle down. But he came alive kind of right at the end of the first. And he almost set up a goal, but uh, Fogel got blocked at the net by Mikola, I believe it was, and Mikola got a penalty. Good call by the refs, who I actually think did a pretty good job in this game. Mm-hmm. Give him credit. And I actually think the ref, the officiating in this and series... they scored on that power play. So. Yeah, the officiating in this series has been pretty good. So he came to life really at the end of the first, and then on that power play, he charges in, tries to beat four defenders, and he almost does it, which was a nice bit of foreshadowing, Bruce. Mm-hmm. A moment later... Um, Nuge gets a good shot, almost scores at the side of the net, wins the puck. McDavid passes to McDavid, to Bush, and the Bush bomb blasts it in with off Hyman. So he gets an assist there. Mm-hmm. Then um, then he then comes his his weird goal, great goal, where um, Bush sends it down the ice, lobs it down the ice to Fogel, who charges in really hard and wins the puck, gives it to McDavid, who kind of comes in from down the wing and from an angle and throws it into Bobrovsky's feet, which is a good play, and scores. And um, that just had to, you know what, this is my old theory, you you do not come back from bad goals. It's not always true, but it's true, it's true 90% of the time. You do not, but not far enough. You do not come back and win the game after a, a rancid goal, and that was a really rancid goal on Bobrovsky. After that um, uh, came a play, uh, you know, a highlight real play. And he's had a couple in these playoffs. This might be at the top of the list. It's it's one where it's so good. Like, usually the TV announcers are chattering on and on. 
describing the play as it's going on when they're doing the highlights. <clears throat> There's some plays that are so fantastic, they shut up and they just run the play and then they run it again and then they run it again, all in silence. So you can just drink it in. And that's what Sportsnet did tonight with this replay where McDavid goes in, he beats E2 Luasterainen, who's a quite a fantastic defensive player, I think, at the blue line. Then he splits um, Mikola and Kulikov with great stick handling. And then pulls Bob over towards him because Bob's really worried at this point. And then whips a pass to Corey Perry, who makes no mistake and drills that puck in the net. That was a fantastic goal at a key moment in the playoffs for Connor McDavid. It's it's a goal of his dreams and our dreams. So way to go. Yeah, maybe, uh, would you have given him a 10, Bruce? Uh, I would have thought long and hard about it for sure. Yeah, he did make you know, one mistake on a, a great A shot against, but. Okay. Well, 10 doesn't mean perfect anymore. It just means transcendent. I would suggest he was transcendent at least on the Perry goal. And two goals, two assists in a, in a you know, road win elimination game in the finals. <laughs> Oh, one was a weird goal and one was the empty netter. I'm yeah. going to give him a 10. I'm changing it to a 10. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I think yeah. So. It's hard to, it's, it's it's hard to to quibble with, yeah. Because you know, I mean, he was the first star with a bullet. I think everybody's books. You know, you know what <clears> I really <throat> liked in the third period. There's some Oilers who still can't figure out how to play defense, like who, who don't really get it, like yeah. fundamentally don't. It seems, mm -hmm. but he was in the third period. He did. He gets it now, and he really plays. He comes back hard. He doesn't skimp on his back check. Coming back hard isn't just being beside the guy with the puck. It's taking him out of the play. So, like, players like Yanmark and Henrik and Brown do that regularly, Derek Ryan. But a lot of the other guys don't. Like, they'll come back, and they'll just kind of coast alongside the guy, even in a tight game. McDavid is now doing that. Like, he's taking the puck off him. Winning puck and, battles, uh, yeah, and then, yeah, and then making that, a safe pass back to the D-man and circling for the breakout. Not trying to do everything himself, but, you know, turning the tide. He's become, when he wants, like, it's not like he's mistake-free, and he does, has a tendency to puck watch at times, too, in his own zone, but... Um, he is a focused, he's becoming ever more focused on defense. So 10 it is. Bruce, your second good thing. Yeah, second good thing. I'm going to go with um, uh, our special teams again. They won them this game. They did. Three to zero, they won the special teams game. One to three, they lost the five on five game. And then, of course, there was an empty netter at the tail end by McDavid uh, that uh, I put it away. Uh, and the Oilers did have uh, five power play opportunities to three, I think it was officially. And uh, uh, roughly double the amount of power play time as uh, Florida had. And their power play was not great. Uh, there was one in the first period that was uh, whatever the opposite of great is, because uh, none of McDavid, Drysaddle, or Nugent Hopkins could handle the puck. Like they, they each like made two bobbles on it in the same power play, and it just just went nowhere. And I'm sure the ice in Florida. I mean, we're talking about a, a playing hockey two degrees from the Tropic of Cancer at the June solstice, summer solstice. I don't think the game was designed <laughs> for this. And uh, the ice, uh, you know, the ice surface was a major factor. You could see both teams struggling with it in this game. And McDavid kind of solved it. And because of him solving it, the power play connected twice right at the end of the two power plays. They got one at... Uh, 158 of the second of a power play that started at the beginning of the series. And then there was a penalty at uh, 10.02 and Edmonton scored at 11.54. So again, after having not much success. So anyway, finally tonight the power play broke through with two power play goals. And the short-handed unit got one short-handed goal and Florida got nothing on either of their units. And suddenly after... Uh, the first three games are nothing going for Edmonton. The last two games, their special teams have scored five and allowed zero. And yeah. 
it's been a great uh, uh, weapon for Edmonton, not not just the power play, but the differential between how good the power play has been producing versus how poorly the other team's power play has been producing because the Edmonton penalty killers are getting her done. And so they're up to one one short one power play goal against in something over 40. Florida scored on one in game two. That that broke a 34 for 34 run. And then yeah, there was six they seconds killed left. like six or seven more. Yeah, there was just so, six seconds left, and there. Right. I think Bouchard was out there. Usually they had the post power play demon out there, and yeah. it wasn't quite post power play yet, and they got burned. Was what happened. But indeed, it happened. Anyway, Bouchard. they. They, uh, the units got her done again tonight, and a little bit of an asterisk in that, you know, the, the power, power play, they did have some good moments, but there was a whole lot of erratic stuff, and again, it's partly the ice, but end of the day, they popped two home, uh, including uh, uh, the 2 nothing and the 4-2 goal with the ladder standing up as the uh, game winner in what was effectively a one-goal game. Indeed. All right, Bruce, I will go with Stuart Skinner. It's my other good thing. And it's mainly based on two saves in the first couple minutes of the game. And he's not known for his great side-to-side lateral movement saves, but both of these Mm -hmm. were that kind of save. The first one, um, I should say, Sam Reinhart got a hard shot, but he shot it right at Skinner. So that but, you know, Skinner came out. He was right in place, made himself big in the net, and he's big. Um, and he made that stop. A minute later, it's Ekblad. And um, this is this is on par with his great save in game five um, early in the first period. This is on uh, the, the, the Ekblad puck. save? Yeah, Fantastic. I think. Fantastic. Yeah. The puck comes across yeah. to Ekblad. And he just harpoons it at net, and he's gonna. He, he, Skinner just dives across the net, and again, just another dramatic push across and major, major save. Got his glove on it, and then smothered the puck. He was also. Um, I didn't. He he. Um, the Kachuk shot on the first goal was a was a fantastic shot. So it's kind of hard to fault the goalie on that. He's in on alone on a breakaway because of a series of breakdowns, which we're going to get into. The um, he didn't. He made a turnover to kick off the sequence of pain on Florida's second goal. But on the shot itself, we'll talk about that in a moment, what happened. Um, so I, he, he had some role in the second goal because of a turnover. Mm-hmm. The third one was another really, really difficult. Oh. It was a low high pass to like Ekman Larson who just it's let it rip. Very car. difficult shot. But he, he played well in, late in the second again. There was about three or four grade-A shots as Florida was battling back late in the second. That was actually their most dangerous moment um, in their comeback attempt. They had the one goal in the third, but not much else going on in terms of grade-A shots. Um, so Skinner was good then. He was really solid. He made the necessary save. So he outplayed, he outbattled Sergei Bobrovsky. If you do that, you've had an outstanding hockey game. Your bad thing, Bruce. Yeah, no argument on Skinner. He's uh, and they they zeroed in on the on how good he's been late in series. I see they had a split yeah. now for for first three games and then subsequent games, and he's been tremendous uh, later on in series with the Oilers. You know, facing elimination or being down in the series and and needing to come back like they did against Dallas. Anyway, my bad thing is the first Florida goal. And if there's one thing I've had a pet peeve about with the Oilers, and I probably would with any team because you do see this happen a lot, is that no lead is safe. <clears throat> they, they opened a lead up to 3 nothing in the second period, and later to 4-1, same thing happened there, even faster. And my sort of inner... Fan just wants to see a full rotation of all the lines. When you get a goal and you establish a bigger lead, just just to just to stabilize, solidify that lead, get a full rotation of four lines. Well, that didn't happen on either of these occasions. This first one lasted 
just under two minutes where it was three nothing. And what happened was the sequence that it wasn't the same particulars, <clears throat> but it was kind of the same mindset of a, of a horrible play in game one of the 2006 Stanley Cup Finals. I don't forget these things. I bet there's a lot of fans out there that's going to remember this play. Or is it just scored to go up 3 nothing in the second period at Carolina? And they had, uh, as I recall, a two-on rush, one rush, and Jason Smith, of all people, decided to jump into the play and join the rush. And the play went sideways, and Carolina comes back on a four-on-two or whatever, you know, and one of the D-men just isn't there because he just jumped up into the play. And I love Jason Smith, but my complaint at that moment, and I wasn't alone, was, what are you doing? You got the three-goal lead. You know, now's the time to not be taking silly chances to try and score the next goal. It's just to make sure there are no next goals in the game. I mean, sure, you'll take your chance when you get one, but... Anyway, tonight that happened where they were coming out of their own end. Dry Settle shoveled the puck up the boards to Dylan Holloway, right along the boards on his wrong side, which is uh, one of the handicaps he's trying to play through. And he got engaged right away by, that would be the guy who got the assist on the play, Evan Rodriguez. And Dry Settle followed up behind uh, Holloway. Bouchard comes busting out the bo- uh, of the zone, uh, uh, looking for a pass from Holloway. Ekholm comes busting out of the zone on the other side, and it's like, why are you guys all roaring up the ice when the puck isn't out of your zone yet? Like, what the hell are you doing? This thought was foremost in my mind while Holloway was still engaged in the battle, and you could just see the abandonment. <sighs> And sure enough, Holloway lost the battle. Rodriguez chipped it through to Matt Kachuk. And all of the defensive triangle, like uh, Dreisaitl, Bouchard, and Ekholm, were gone. They all just, I think we charged them all with missed assignments because they just forgot to play their position for a crucial two seconds. And boom, in the net. Bouchard, I mean, oh. in theory, you can, Bouchard, you can say, well, okay, you're a defenseman. You're allowed to. He was in position because Drysdale kind of got knocked a little bit over, so he wasn't in position. Like so, if Holloway's going to make a pass, so Holloway's in a board battle, and um, his mistake is he kind of wins the board battle, but then he 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 tries to pass it up and it gets picked off again. I think, and he sh- just should have re- reversed the puck or held the puck once he won it, yeah. but yes. he tried to move it. So that's the first big mistake. And Bush, so Bouchard's rushing up, and he's counting. He knows Drysaddle's back there, so he's counting on, on Drysaddle to cover for him. But as Jason Strudwick says, Bruce, never trust a forward. And Leon is—he's—I no, don't know—he's not aware that well, someone's well. behind him, and he's moving up the ice, and he's not covering. He's not covering for Bouchard. You know, he's not hanging back and playing defense. He's thinking, I'm joining the rush now. And then Ekholm, I, I think Ekholm and Drysaddle are the two. Ekholm, he shouldn't, it's a 50-50 battle on the boards. Yeah. You don't know what's going to happen. So why are you creeping up there? Why don't you move to the middle of the ice in case something goes wrong? So I think Especially Ekholm and Drysaddle, already jailed in particular, are the ones to that I didn't like on that play. Like, man, well, just play defense. If you're yeah, if you're covering for the defense, cover for the defense. Got a three nothing if you're lead. a defenseman play defense and Bouchard didn't even have to he could have been more conservative too like he didn't necessarily have to to rush to to, to make a rush play now I know that they don't they're telling the players we don't want you to sit back we want you to attack blah 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 and I understand that attack mentality chances I don't think you needed to take a chance there and um well wound up being a break an in zone breakaway as I call it where Kachuk was alone with the goalie, and there was no zone entry required because the puck never got out. It's what cost them the first three games, Bruce. It's a freebie. It's a mental mm-hmm. mistake by, I think, essentially mm-hmm. two players mainly, and it leads to the lost a goal. battle by one. You just you just give them. You lost battle by one. Lost physical battle by one, and you just give away a goal when when you had oh, all the oh, momentum. Was hot. All the momentum, and now the comeback is on. The there's crowd's no, back no into it. Out. Like, I'm thinking, you know, let's just wind a whole bunch of minutes off this clock while they're yeah. down and out, right? Yeah. And 
anyway. Fortunately, they got the next goal. And yeah, the, fortunately, they got the next goal. And then what happened, David? Your turn. <laughs> well, Broberg and Nurse were on the ice, man, and they, it was honestly, Bruce, it was chaos when they were out there. They had a rough game. This was yeah. Philip Broberg's weakest game. Yeah, by he far. looked nervous from the start. Uh-huh. And um, Darnell Nurse, he, he had some good moments, Nurse, but he also had some bad ones. And he's he's not going to settle down your pairing at this point. I mean, they had been counting on Broberg to settle it down. And anyway, there it's a battle in the corner, and both Ryan and Broberg um, get beat out of the corner, as I recall. I think I'm recalling this correctly. And it goes to for uh, th- this is where Skinner actually starts it off with the turnover. He he passes right. to nobody in the corner, so mm-hmm. they have to go win the puck. When 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 they had possession from Skinner, he should have probably reversed it the other direction. I think. Anyway, he didn't, and it's a mm-hmm. turnover. It's in the corner. Ryan and Broberg are left battling for it, and they lose the battle. It comes out front, and uh, I can't remember who shot the puck. McLeod, McLeod couldn't pick off the pass. McLeod couldn't pick off the pass, and he was so. Then, then he was watching the pass, so he didn't cover the shooter and the danger man right coming into the slot. We've talked about this player before. He's not cover. He's not looking for the danger man. He's looking for the pass, and he misses the pass. And boom, there's a uh, a shot, and then the puck bounces high. And Broberg loses the battle at the side of the net to, uh, is it Rodriguez who scores? And um, Nurse. I believe it was. Yeah. yeah and Nurse, yeah. Nurse is back there too. Just in time, Darnell Nurse to the rescue. The shot comes. And just as it's about to go wide, it looks like Darnell mm-hmm. it hits Nurse and goes in the net. So, Bruce, we have, we have been the chronicler of. Many, many times where the puck is going in off Darnell Nurse into the net, we are still mystified somewhat about why that happens. I think he's overly aggressive on the ice and not sometimes calm enough. Perhaps might be one of the part of the answer. Anyway, goes in off Nurse and into the net. Own goals, they call them in soccer. We call them deflected in or whatever, but that was yeah. an own goal, and he has more of them than anybody. I, I bet you every year we've been doing this, he's been number one. Well, kind and of some years more defense. than all the rest of the defensemen combined is the sh- is like is the yeah. shock. Yeah, that's the top. That's where it gets a little bit confusing, and we 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 don't know the answer, and we yeah. never will. It's right. under a black cloud. Man, he, he he makes good plays too. Yeah, Although he had he a rushed, couple of great shot blocks. Period, he he still had five shot blocks. Up. In the third period, he was still rushing up the ice. There was one play. I'm thinking, what are you doing, man? Like, well, at least he had the puck. He wasn't like flying the zone while someone else was losing the puck. That's a good point. So there's that. There is that. Bruce, your number. Yeah, my number is 26, and for the second game in a row. I'm going to uh, point out and celebrate the modern Edmonton Oiler who broke a long-standing record held by a great Edmonton Oiler from the dynasty years, uh, four decades ago. Last game, it was Connor McDavid getting his 32nd assist of the playoffs to to, uh, break Wayne Gretzky's 36-year-old record. Well, tonight, it's Evan Bouchard who picked up his 24th, 25th, and 26th assists playoffs, so another assist record, to pass uh, none other than his coach, Paul Coffey, who had 25 assists in 1985. In fact, in 1985, Coffey, in those playoffs, he scored 12 goals, 25 assists, 37 points, and all three of them have stood untied, let alone unbeaten, as the NHL record in each department for the subsequent 39 years until tonight. And now we have Evan Bouchard. on. Here's the list. Evan Bouchard, 26. Paul Coffey, 24. 25. Al McGinnis, 24. Brian Leach, 23. Kale McCarr, 21. Uh, Amiro Haskinen, 20. Bobby Orr, 19, Ray Bork, 18. These are some pretty good defensemen on this list, David. You know, Bobby Orr, Ray Bork, Kel <laughs> McCann, McGinnis, okay. Paul Koch. Evan Bouchard. Evan Bouchard is number one on this list with games to go. 
26 assists and also six goals. So he's got 32 points, and that makes him one of only three D-men ever to, to score over 30 points in the playoffs. Only, uh, i got to click on a different, no, nope, I'm wrong, four D-men ever, but he's third. Uh, Paul Coffey, 37. That record still stands for now. Uh, Brian Leach, 34. Boosh, 32. McGinnis, 31. I was the only four D men to ever get 30 points in, in the playoffs. So, Boosh delivering the goods for the last year. He had 17 points in 12 games. This year, he's got 32 points in 23 games. Like, way over a point a game, almost, you know, 1.4, which is fantastic for a forward and off the charts for a defenseman. And he also put. Aaron Eckblad on his butt last game with a good hit. <laughs> I missed that. And it, they showed it in the intermission when I was grading scoring chance. So I didn't see it till the next day. And I'm going, damn, I would have given him a whole extra point for that. Because it was fantastic. Eckblad was the guy who tried to choke him out earlier in the series. Yeah. And he thought he was running Bouchard in the corner late in the first period. And Bouch saw him coming and he just put him down hard. And then he, you know, Stared him he, down a bit. Stared him down as he was picking himself up off the ice. And I'm thinking, good on you. I mean, Aaron Eckblad's not exactly a small guy, you know. And Bush just got the better of him and put him down. He came the length of the ice, Eckblad, to hit Bouchard. To yeah, pick on like, Bouchard again and to send a message to the Oilers in that game. Mm-hmm. He and came the first, length yeah. of the ice to hit him. And 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 Bouchard yeah, caught him with his ass. Get the reverse hit, a little bit of a reverse hit. It was fantastic. And was that ever standing up to the bully? I yeah. love that play, Bruce. That was yeah. like, that was a good one. Bruce, my number is similar to yours in, in terms of an oiler setting a record. Connor McDavid, um, he didn't set a record, but he's moving up the charts uh, with a bullet. He's now got 42 points this playoff season, eight goals and th- a record 34 assists. So he added to his record of 34 of assists now 34 um he th- there's only two players in nhl history who have scored more points in a playoff mm-hmm. season Connor mcdavid this year wayne gretzky and Mary lemieux wayne gretzky has the record 47 points so mcdavid's five points back and then lemieux has 44 and gretzky has another season of 43 so um another 40 yeah, another 40, uh, 30. And David, David passed out, so he's in fourth absolutely. place all the time yeah. tonight. 42. That's yeah. amazing. Bruce. And considering that we've spent much of the playoffs wondering if he was injured <laughs> and going on all cylinders, um, he does seem to be picking up steam again right about now. Maybe it's because he they're... Uh, flying tonight. Holy yeah. moly, he was coming hard when he had the puck. And coming hard the other way when he didn't. Maybe Florida's a little worried about taking a... Like, I didn't notice there was much slashing in the last few games on McDavid as there was in that one game when he was slashed every five minutes of puck... Five seconds of puck possession. I I think that my story got in the heads of the NHL and the referees, Bruce, on that one. Clearly. (laughs) We all do our our best. Um, Anyway, yeah. What a player, and that 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 uh, Perry, you know the, the the setup on the Perry goal. What a what a player. What a player. Mm-hmm. He is Bobby Orr at center. You know mm-hmm. that's people who wonder what Bobby Orr was like. Mm-hmm. The, Bobby Orr was a lot like Connor McDavid. He just played defense. He was a bit more Brobergy in terms of being um, in terms of his skating style. He was mm-hmm. he didn't look like he was moving fast, even as he's moving super fast. McDavid's a little bit more lightning quick. But very similar um, players in a lot of ways. I remember you making that comparison in McDavid's draft year. I think even before the lottery. Yeah. And then, yeah. of course, won the lottery. And, and that was an interesting lens to, through which to consider McDavid. And uh, he's lived up to that. Uh, uh, your old colleague Cam Cole was uh, ruminating after the game about how uh, much as he still considers Gretzky to be, you know, in a class by himself, as do I, I have to say, um, that McDavid is more of a visceral great yeah. player in the, you know, in the mode of or or 
Lemieux, Richard. I think he said. Yeah, Lemieux is a good, yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, so I answered back to Cam and said that you had called him Bobby Orr uh, playing center way back when. And he said, I hope you wrote down the time and date that Staples got one right. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, tell him I said hi. So he said hi. <laughs> a great, a great journalist and a great guy. He was a fantastic hockey writer. I oh, loved reading his so stuff. Great. Yeah, he was, he was, he was writing the glory days of the orders and he really yes. did them justice. Yeah. And, and a really fine guy, like just mm -hmm. a great guy. Um, <laughs> all right. The conundrum, Bruce. Do you believe now? now Bruce. well i never disbelieved i've just been <laughs> watching the games uh you know they're not know. going right they're all 50 50 games so you know when you're down over three we talked about these odds earlier but they're shortening shortening uh i don't agree with people that said if they win tonight they're coming back to florida for sure they got to win no. game six you cannot just, just sort of say we're coming home we're going to win game six we said that last year against vegas didn't have I, I hate it. I hated people that. saying you that. Don't do that. It's not true. It's but, how yeah. do you know that's true? The hell, Kelly Haruti said it tonight. Well, well, that's Florida not true won at game all. Three in Edmonton. Anyway, you know you got to take game six when it comes, and then if you manage to work your way through that, then you it's all falls to the wall for game seven at that point. But. Yeah. Um, I, I definitely think they have a fighting chance. There's a few things they have to work out, uh, like their D pairings. Uh, we, ha we had much more glorious numbers to discuss tonight, but here's an inglorious number. Philip Broberg, 14 minutes on the ice, two shot attempts by Edmonton, 25 by Florida, two to 25. That pairing got crushed. They Only one goal against, but caved. you know that's caved. that's the first game I've seen where Broberg looked looked. Uh, I thought both he and Holloway had their moments tonight where they really showed their youth and inexperience, and they lost battles. So, you know, quite I'm a, a little loss, worried but, about the dry saddle line as well, Bruce. Like I'm worried I just, about dry saddle. Period. Yeah, Leon's not. He did really little I, in I just, this game. I think he needs just just focus Leon on defense. If you can, if you can, so, like shut him down on defense, which he's capable of doing, and not like I think he's beating himself up because he's not getting points and attacking well. Don't worry about it, man. Play defense. You and Nuge and Holloway, shut them down. You're, you, you know, you and Holloway are big guys, and Nuge is a strong defensive player when he wants to be. Shut them down. You're mm -hmm. doing your job. That's all you have to do for the Oilers to win. But they didn't do it tonight. They were out for a goal against. And um, that was my worry going in the game. And, um, you know, my worry was that we we're going to have the usual freebies. And we came close, but fortunately, that didn't mm -hmm. happen. Firstly, I think in terms of the orders, freebies at the other end. So we sure did. The, the um, Here's what I would say about, like, we, I think if my memory serves correctly, when we were talking about the orders coming back, I don't know if we said this, we were talking about, when, it, when they were down 4 nothing, they had to win um, four coin flips in a row, which were all weighted 50-50. Mm -hmm. But we thought, after we had talked about it a little, we thought actually maybe it's weighted, each coin flip's weighted a little bit in Florida's favor at that point. We thought Florida might have the edge in play um, at that point because of Bobrovsky, essentially, because he had been such a huge factor. So we were thinking it's a little bit more, maybe like 55-45. But now mm -hmm. I think it's two coin flips, so it was one in 16 odds at that point, if it's two 50-50 coin flips. And that's what I actually thought it was, like close to that. Like I didn't think it was like like one in 107, whatever, how many NHL seasons there's been. There's only been one team that's come back right. from that kind of deficit. I didn't think it was that ever because it, these two teams were close. And so I thought it was more like one in 16. So now we're down to... Uh, Two games, two two coin flips, one and four. But I think actually the coin is now weighted, and I'm going to say 66-33 in each game for the Oilers. I think the Oilers are clear favorites now in a single game. They're they have shown they're starting to establish dominance, some dominance against Florida, 
and I think it's real. I think they are. If the goaltending is is equal or better, I think the Oilers are a better team than Florida. And um, so, yeah, I, whatever those odds are, if you flip it in the 66% chance of winning at each time, um, maybe you can work out the permutations and combinations on that one. Oh, well, if it's 66%, it's still only four and nine chance to get them both. Good work. So. There you go. They're still, so it's still, it, you know, less than 50% chance they're going to do it. So, but it's, it's there. And if you just take it game by game, one game, because each game is a single unit, right? So if you have that edge, but anyway, whatever, this is all just guessing well, at the Bobrovsky odds. Bobrovsky is now uh, in the last two games, last game, five goals on 16 shots tonight, four goals on 23 uh, for a combined save percentage of 769 over those two games. Tonight he was, you know, last game was 688, tonight 826, but that's still not very good. They better go to Stellars, I think. You know, they better pull that guy and go to Stellars. Well, Stellars, former Oiler, he led the NHL qualified goalies 25 or more games in save percentage and goals against average. And they got him on the bench, but he's not the worst option, but I think Bob's their man, you know. Oh, no. Yeah, Bob's their man. He's going to stick with Bob. It'll be... Whatever happens in Edmonton, it's it's gonna it's gonna be a really tough game next game. They could yeah. they could lose easily, and then yeah. they got to go back to Florida and win again in Florida. Yeah. Wow, that yeah. they've got their work cut out from them, but they got a fighting chance. They sure do. How many you teams know. have come back from being down three to two in a series and won the series? Because that's where we're at, frankly. You know? uh, well, so uh, that's Boston did it against Vancouver in 2011. There you go. Where they were down two nothing and then three two in the series and then they won game six and seven I think four one and four nothing they just took over that series yeah uh, Montreal uh, Canadians did it against Chicago in seventy one I remember that one well where it was uh, three to two for uh, Chicago and then uh, uh, the Pocket Rocket got the tying and winning goals in game seven at Chicago Stadium after Jacques Lemaire scored from center. To cut Chicago's two nothing lead that they had in Game Seven, they couldn't hold it, and so that's another time that it happened right in the Stanley Cup Finals. And I think there are more, but I, you know, I would need a minute to think about it and another probably ten minutes to look it up. You know, one encouraging thing is, well, their Skinner's play, and they really did do a good job of shutting them down in the last fifteen minutes of the game after that goal against. Mm-hmm. They Florida didn't get a lot they had one really good sh- shot that i thought was going in but sam bennett got in the way of it and mm. stopped it from going in too bad and, yeah too bad and no, um no. yeah no neither am i he's he is a good player and he's an unrelenting uh hard player that probably lots of coaches would would like but uh, i'm not a fan he's dirty <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's an agitator for sure yeah. All righty. Well, Bruce, I think we uh, got our beat. I think that's it. Any final thoughts? I'm thinking Pittsburgh in 09, you know, when they won uh, when they won in Detroit. They came from 3-2 down in that series, pretty sure. I didn't and actually expect you to have an answer, Bruce, but of course you do. Because <laughs> you have the encyclopedic memory of, of uh, remembrance of things past. Uh <laughs> <laughs> it's happened quite a bit in Yeah, they won series. game 6-2-1 and game 7-2-1. No nail Boom. biters there. Boom. It's going to Andre Fleury robbed Nick Lidstrom with 1 second left in game 7 to uh preserve the lead and win the cup. It's going to come down to the smallest of margins and the you know the bounce of the puck the the skill of one particular player under pressure in one moment you know the, it, it will be there might be one of these final games it's not close but um if it does go to uh, we're going to have at least one close game if the order is going to win this it's going to be and this one turned out to be a close game it really was i mean they got up four to one so um but they did fight back to four to three. It was kind of like the Oilers game in game three, right? Where they got up 
the Florida Panthers got up four to one, right? And then the owners yeah. made it close, made it four or three. So, but that game really didn't feel this that close, that one. This one felt a little closer than that one. But the owners did shut them down in the third period. I got two more for you. Colorado in 2001 against New Jersey. They were down 3-2. And they won game 6-4-0, game 7-3-1. And then there were the Tampa Bay Lightning over the Calgary Flames in uh, 2004, where the Bolts were down three games to two. They won game 6-3-2 in double overtime. This was the famous game where Martin Jelena, everybody in Calgary thinks, scored a goal that did not past video review as it was cr- crossing the goal line. It remains a uh, bitter pill. Uh, and then the Bolts won game seven, two to one to win the cup. So that's like, what do we got now? One, two, three, four in this Just century. This century. Well, now, Bruce, either you're there's showing not that off. many seven game series, right? But there's been four of them where the team that was trailing three to two came back to win the Stanley Cup. This is just yeah. Stanley Cup finals. Now, now you're either showing off or you're using the internet. To I'm doing it. both. But I, I remembered them. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's serious. I'm pretty sure they won game six. I mean, I know who won game seven, obviously, in the cup winning years. But uh, yeah, there was, there's been a few, and there might even have been another. So the century. I, I usually miss one. But I got, I got some of them. Good work. Excellent work. Well, it'd be nice to add another one to that pile, wouldn't it? It would. And this one will be all the better because it will actually be coming back from four down. But, you know, it, it, it's uh, yeah. it's now three games to two. So we're in a different spot. Bruce, thanks for talking tonight. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast. <laughs>